Welcome to Central Study Hour here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wherever you may be watching, thank you for joining in with us today, and happy Sabbath and a very happy New Year to each one of you. Um, let's sing hymn number 426. It comes in as a request from Robert Shabba. And fortunately, we don't know where he's from, but we're going to do his song anyway. I shall sing the king, see, see the king, verses one through two and three. Hymn number four twenty six. Let's sing it together. I shall see the king where the angels sing. I shall see the king someday. In the battle land, on the golden strand, and with him shall ever stay. In his glory I shall see the king, and forever endless praises sing. T'was on Calvary Jesus died for me, I shall see the King someday. In the land of song, in the glory throne, where the never comes the night, with my Lord once slain, I shall never reign in the glory land of light. In his glory, I shall see the King, and forever in this praise to sing. T'was on Calvary, Jesus died for me. I shall see the King someday. I shall see the King, all my tributes bring, and shall look upon his face. Then my song shall be how he ransomed me and has kept me by his grace. In his glory I shall see the King and forever in his praise to sing. T'was on Calvary Jesus died for me. I shall see the King Someday. Don't each of you look forward to the time where we can see the King in all his glory. Um, if you have a special song request and would like to share it with us, please go to our website at sackcentral.org. Click on the contact us link there. Tell us who you are, your name, where you're from, and of course the title of the hymn you would have selected. And we'll be happy to sing it with you on an up upcoming Sabbath. Our next song request comes from Lydia Chaplin, and the hymn number is 198, And Can It Be? We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Christmas. 
for prayer. Our most gracious Father in heaven, we pray that you will be with us today. Thank you so much for a new year, new beginnings. Uh, thank you for the, the sacrifice you made for us. What amazing love. Help us to ponder that today. I pray that you will uh, be with those who hear uh, the message this morning. May it be a blessing to each one of us. I'll be with the speaker as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Sabbath school lesson will be presented by Pastor Fred Dana, Associate Pastor here at Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome to Central Study Hour. And whether you are watching online or some connection or you're, whether you're sitting right here in our sanctuary, uh, we're really glad you're here. Our lesson this week is lesson number four in the quarterly on Daniel. And this one's called From Furnace to Palace, The Story of the Fiery Furnace, Daniel 3. This has been a favorite of mine since I first heard it as a child. Anyway, if you're interested in um, um, receiving a CD or DVD of this lesson, uh, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sacscentral.org. Ask for offer C22004. That's 22004. Make sure you leave an address and uh, let us know if you want the DVD or CD version. All right, so let's go right to the quarterly. Uh, uh, again, the title is From Furnace to Palace. And let's just look at that memory verse for a minute. It says, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Daniel 3.17. In this verse, everything exudes confidence. Everything exudes faith. But what they left out of the very verse, it starts with the word if. So they really didn't know. But they had confidence, and they had faith. The full passage uh, with the beginning of the verse and the verse that follows it will show that they didn't actually know they would be delivered. But they did surely know God was able to. And I have a hunch that they thought it would happen. But they had no objective proof. When we come to the page that deals with that, we'll look at it more closely. Uh, there's a, a quotation here from a book called In Heavenly Places that's really good. Just starts right at the beginning of the narrative. It says, Thus these youth imbued with the Holy Spirit, declare to the whole nation their faith that he whom they worshiped is the only true and living God. See, that right there says that their statement of confidence, their statement of faith was led of the Holy Spirit, even though they didn't know how it was going to turn out. Uh, but it says that, you know, they knew that they served the only true and living God. And so he was the one who could do whatever he chose to do. And then it goes on to say, this demonstration of their own faith was, was the most eloquent presentation of their principles. And a lot of times we think that um, how well things can be said 
are what show what faith is. You know, he, he, people say stuff in such an impressive way or, or you have a favorite speaker. But this is bringing out that the demonstration in a crisis, under a test, is what showed real faith, not mere words. All right, goes on to say, in order to impress idolaters with the power and greatness of the living God, his servants must reveal their own reverence for God. So when we want to impress people about God, they need to be impressed with the fact that we're impressed with him. They need to see that we have a reverence for him, that we believe in him. Again, it's not just words that gets that across. It's the life. And it goes on, it says, they must make it manifest that he is the only object of their honor and worship, and that no consideration, not even the preservation of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to idolatry. And then the last sentence of that quote says, these lessons have a direct and vital bearing upon our experience in these last days. So there's tremendous lessons uh, for us here. Now, the, the narrator or the uh, author of the uh, narrative says that scripture reveals that at the end of time, when the world has greatly advanced, so to speak, something similar will unfold, but on a worldwide scale. Where in scripture is that revealed? He says, scripture reveals that this kind of test is going to come again, but on a worldwide scale. Where is it? It's Revelation 13, right? Revelation 13 with the, the beast, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. It says, from the study of this story, we get insights into the issues that according to scripture, God's faithful will face. So I've said this before. These stories, Daniel and Lion's Den, the fiery furnace, they're not stories merely to inspire children. They're stories to inspire adults. Of course, the children we want to be inspired too. And these are stories to inspire elderly people too. You know, when Daniel went in the lion's den, he was probably 80 years old. So don't think that you're retired and you're, you know, that no test ever gonna come to you any, anymore because you don't have the test of work you know, you know, the tests with family, well, that could still be there, right? But great tests come at no matter what age. And so this story of the fiery furnace is for everybody. Lessons and faith. All right, so let's go to uh, Sunday's page, the golden image. And you can go to Daniel 3. I'm not going to read it all. We know this story well. I will hit a couple key verses, but basically tell the story. But we'll start with verse 1. Uh, we're, we're looking at what may have motivated the king to build this golden image. But anyway, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. What's three score cubits? Sixty feet. All right. And the breadth was of six cubits. By the way, if this is a statue of a man, he's a very skinny man. You ever really thought about that? Very skinny. Maybe there was a high pedestal or something. Um, but 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. Uh, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then verse 2 tells us who all was expected to come to gather there. Princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs. All the rulers of the provinces came to the dedication of the image. By the way, when you look at all those positions, they're all government salaried positions. They're all working for whatever government, you know, level that is represented there. All right. So then uh, verse three just tells they were gathered together. The last part of verse three says they stood before the image. Verse four tells us that a, a person with a loud voice spoke on behalf of the king saying, when you hear all the music of all these instruments, fall down and worship the golden image, which Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Verse 6 says, And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then it says, When people heard all the musical instruments, all kinds of music, all the people, the nations and the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image. So they had people there from all the provinces, from all the conquered nations, people that were in charge of those provinces. Nobody was left out. By the way, at this time, 
uh, Jerusalem still stood, hadn't been destroyed yet, and there was a king on the throne that was supposed to be a puppet king for Nebuchadnezzar. Was he there? Of course he was. He wasn't going to be left out. Where was Daniel? Yeah, well, the big question, where was Daniel? We have no information. I kind of suspect that Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel wouldn't be able to handle this and respected Daniel so much, he sent him on a mission somewhere. But we don't know. We're not told. But he's totally out of the picture. All right, so the question is, what motivates the king to make this statue? Well, we can see the setting. Obviously, he's testing the loyalty of every government worker in Babylon and in all the province, provinces. But why now? Why this way? Does it have anything to do with Daniel 2? Uh, you know, when you see that he, the image is all gold, it makes you think of Daniel 2, because what was gold in the image of Daniel 2? Yeah. Only the head, and that represented Nebuchadnezzar, right? So the image of all gold means he's not accepting the dream of Daniel 2 where his kingdom is the head of gold, to be succeeded by a kingdom represented by silver, the chest and arms of silver. All right, so the king wants to be represented by an entire image of gold in order to communicate to his subjects that his kingdom will endure throughout history. Now, Prophets and Kings, page 504, has some interesting insights on this. Uh, you might be surprised to know that the idea of building this image came from his wise men. But they proposed to make it just like it was in a dream and exalt the head of gold. They had not, it had not occurred to them to make it all gold. But, you know, they all knew about the dream. Probably the whole empire knew about the dream. And so they're saying, look, you're the head of gold. Um, why don't you make an image? And people will come and worship this and acknowledge that you're the head of gold. So they're appealing to his ego, of course. And, and then it says, pleased with the flattering suggestion, he determined to carry it out and go even farther. Instead of reproducing the image as he had seen it, he would excel the original. He's going to improve on God, right? Um, and so he made it, he wanted to make it entirely of gold, symbolic, of course, of Babylon as an eternal, indestructible, all-powerful kingdom with him at the head, which should break in pieces all other kingdoms and stand forever. So he's on a big ego trip here. And then it says, the, the thought of establishing the empire and a dynasty that should endure forever appealed very strongly to the mighty ruler before whose arms the nations of the earth had been unable to stand. You got to understand and, and none of us can totally grasp this because none of us have even been close to being in the shoes of Nebuchadnezzar where we've conquered everything we wanted to and we're number one on the planet. There's nobody that fits us in today's world. There's nobody in today's world that has even remotely the type of power Nebuchadnezzar had. And when a person has that kind of power and the customs in the pagan world where people that were powerful were also worshipped as gods... Nebuchadnezzar is in a tremendous conflict in his mind between him being all-powerful God and Daniel's God. So, it's like a little Lucifer, right? And so, on page 505, it says, Daniel's interpretation was to be rejected and forgotten. Truth was to be misinterpreted and misapplied. And says the great golden image, similar in its general features, it, the great golden image was similar in its general features to that which had been seen in vision. Thought you might appreciate those insights from Patriarchs and Prophets. So what we can see here is that the primary characteristic that's at play here is the attitude of pride. And the author of the lesson uh, takes us back to the Tower of Babel. You remember at the Tower of Babel, uh, they thought that if they built a big enough tower, God couldn't drown them out or whatever. They could resist God and rebel against him. They had a pretty small idea of how far up heaven was and all that kind of stuff. But um, 
But here we have Nebuchadnezzar, who is exalting himself, building an image to evoke his power, and thereby assess the loyalty of his subjects. Now, why should Nebuchadnezzar have known better? That sort of seems like a silly question to us, because none of us would think we could do that. But again, we're not in his position, where th things seem to be so possible. So why should he have known better? I'm looking for something other than just regular human humility and proper self-assessment. <laughs> well, you remember Daniel 1? He himself had declared that these three Hebrews and Daniel were 10 times wiser than all his smartest men in his kingdom. And in Daniel 2, uh, all the other experts failed to even tell him what he had dreamed. And then, but Daniel not only could tell him what he dreamed, he gave him the interpretation. And not only that, he told him what he was thinking before the dream happened. And so the king already had given testimony to the fact of the superiority of the God of Daniel. In Daniel 2, 47, he said, your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. So he has already declared who the Almighty is. And now, he doesn't like that. He's had time to think about it. He's made sure Daniel's out of the picture so Daniel can't mess things up. And Daniel's three friends are the ones that are going to are facing the, the fire, literally. All right, so uh, anyway, Nebuchadnezzar had already had what the author calls some good theology lessons, but they weren't good enough or they weren't enough to prevent him from reverting back to idolatry. Again, it's because of the kind of power he had. Do you think any of us can comprehend the temptation to pride on the level Nebuchadnezzar had it? Probably not. None of us have had so much uh, submission by multitudes, and sometimes n never by anybody. And, um, and, you know, none of us have had such power. None of, us, none of us has a clue how that kind of power can go to somebody's head. I mean, all you got to do is look at professional athletes today who, because they can do something with a ball, are almost like little demagogues. You know, and that goes to their head. And, but this is nothing compared to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so, uh, but we do, we all do understand pride. Because even though we may not have temptations of pride in the same circumstances and level as Nebuchadnezzar, everybody has temptations of pride. It's as common as the air we breathe. Sinful human beings resist acknowledging the fact that their material and intellectual accomplishments are vanity and are doomed to disappear. I won some races when I was high school age. And I still remember them and feel good about it. <laughs> like I was something, you know. And, uh, you know, so it happened to be that day nobody could beat me. But I'm sure there were hundreds and hundreds of places on the earth I could have gone and somebody would have, right? So anyway, the author suggests that we all can be like little Nebuchadnezzars. So in my own way, I've been a little Nebuchadnezzar. And you can laugh at me, but I'm not alone. <laughs> All right? So it says, we pay too much attention to our accomplishments and forget how meaningless they can be in the face of eternity. Now, at the bottom of the page, there's this question. How can we learn not to fall, even in very subtle ways, into the same trap that Nebuchadnezzar fell into? Or maybe I could ask it this way. How can we avoid becoming arrogant, proud, and puffed up like Nebuchadnezzar, you know, that forgot God is really overall and deserves our love and loyalty? Or what should keep us properly humble? I heard keep your eyes on Jesus. Um, so I came up with two answers, and I just heard one of them. But I'm going to suggest this one. One of the ways to keep humble is to keep praying the prayer of Psalm 139, 23, and 24. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because when you're praying and asking God to show you your heart and at the same time, you're not focusing on you, you're focusing on Jesus, his greatness of character, the greatness of his sacrifice for us. You have Jesus, the great contrast with human pride and it puts it in its right place. And so you got to kind of do both. But focus on Jesus. Ask God, help me to see myself as I really am. You know, take away my illusions of somehow being better than anybody else. Just show me who I really am. All right, let's go to um, Monday's page. All right, we're continuing in the book of Daniel because uh, verse 7 of chapter 3 said that they all fell down and worshipped. Um, and then verse 8 tells us that there was someone, someone saw someone that didn't. And, um, you know, that was, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they go in and tell the king. And verse 12 is their report. There are certain Jews over whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What, do you think there's some significance in the fact that they chose at that very moment to remind the king that he was the one who set them up in their positions? Do you think they're trying to get the king extra mad? It's a little bit of a challenge to him as well as to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then verse 13, it, it worked anyway, one way or the other, because it says Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded that they be brought. Verse 14, he asked them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He says, is this true? Is this report true? And then uh, he, he, he's give them a second chance. Now, if ye be ready, verse 15, when you hear the music, fall down and worship the image which I have made and well. Because, so you, in this second chance, if you just do it right, everything will be well, we'll kind of overlook that first thing. He says, but if you worship not, you should be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? All right. Now, I want you to think for a minute. The, uh, the author of Quarterly brought out some stuff here that I don't know how much there is to this. I hadn't um, ever thought of this before. But he said that the plain of Dura translated um, from Akkadian means a walled place. So the plain of Dura has natural, either natural or built up walls around it. And it says it gives the impression of a vast sanctuary. And it says if that were not enough, the furnace nearby can well evoke an altar. And what was put on altars in the pagan world? Yeah, sacrifices. Uh, they would put on, animal sacrifices were on the altar, the Hebrew altar too. In this case, human sacrifice uh, would be more consistent, well, would be kind of common with pagans. And then it says Babylonian music is to be part of the liturgy. <laughs> the liturgy. Babylonian music. All right, so this is interesting. It so he, he's suggesting that it sounds like a worship service. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, right? Worship the image. And if you don't make the gods happy, we'll sacrifice you to them in the burning fiery furnace. And music is the signal of when, when to do what. So Babylon music is to be part of the liturgy. Let me ask you something. Is Babylonian music part of the liturgy of Babylonian worship today? Hmm. All right. Well, um, then it says to read Revelation 13, 11 to 18. And we're going to look for parallels between what we just covered in Daniel 3 and what's in Revelation 13. So let's go to Revelation 13 and read those verses. And because um, this is where we're getting how the story of the fiery furnace has its end time counterpart that we will face. All right. Revelation 13, start with verse 11. All right. Everybody with me? Amen. Okay. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. 
And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. All right, so the question is, what parallels can we see between what happens in Daniel's time and what will happen in the future? All right, so... I think what's real obvious here is, is forced worship, right? Because in Daniel 3, if you don't bow down and worship, you go to the fiery furnace. And Revelation 13, if you don't accept the image of the beast and worship the beast and receive his mark, you'll be killed, okay? So besides forced, wor forced, wor forced worship, there's a death decree, all right? Fiery furnace or be killed. Revelation 13 is be killed. All right, so according to prophecy, we are living the last days of Earth's history. Revelation 13 here announces that the inhabitants of the earth will be called to worship the image of the beast. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Revelation 13, I don't believe, has music in it, but Revelation 18, when it describes Babylon, music is a very important part of Babylon just like music was an important part of the Fiery Furnace episode. So anyway, uh, the image erected by Nebuchadnezzar is just an illustration of what the end time Babylon will do in the last days. Isn't it interesting that the book of Revelation has an end time Babylon and in the book of Daniel we have a literal Babylon? So what hap what's actually happening there is the events in Babylon in Daniel's time become types. And Revelation makes them into anti-types of a spiritual uh, application. All right, so therefore we would do well to pay close attention to what transpires in this narrative and how God sovereignly directs the affairs of the world. Now at the bottom of the page, it asks a question. You know, it says, well, first it says, worship isn't just bowing down before something or someone and openly professing ultimate allegiance. What are other ways, much more subtle ways, that we can end up worshiping something other than our Lord? So is idolatry only something you kneel to or bow down to? All right, so anything that we place as a higher priority than God assumes the form of an idol in our lives. Further up in the narrative, uh, the author kind of dealt with this. On the second full paragraph, it says, Today we are bombarded from every side by calls to adopt new lifestyles, new ideologies, to abandon our commitment to the authority of God as expressed in his word, and to surrender our allegiance to contemporary successors of the Babylonian Empire. It's interesting. He's calling the people that are influencing people to the ways of the world today, calling them contemporary successors of the Babylonian Empire. They're all around us. They're even in Christianity. The allure of the world at times seems overwhelming, but we should remind ourselves that our ultimate allegiance belongs to the Creator God. Do you think there's some people who have already cast off their allegiance and just go through the motions of going to church, but they're, they really have other gods in their lives running it, and they give lip service to the God of heaven? Is that possible? All right, let's go to uh, Tuesday's lesson, the test of fire. You know, the test of fire, you know, this whole thing obviously is counterfeit worship, right? Uh, and and in, in the opening paragraph, halfway through the narrative, the author says, 
about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, although they hold offices in the empire and are loyal to the king, their allegiance to God sets a limit on their human loyalty. All right, so they're loyal to the king. But there's limits to that, right? They are certainly willing to continue to serve the king as faithful administrators. However, they cannot join this ceremony. You know, the, the king of, of uh, Judah that was there and bowed, he was thinking of multiple gods. He didn't see himself as being disloyal because that's how rationalized their minds were. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew better. They knew there was only one true and living God, one creator, one sustainer, and he and he only deserved their worship. Sometimes when you know a lot, you don't have any wiggle room. <laughs> so sometimes we like to be ignorant, give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. And that's what people did in the ancient world too. Okay, so... Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew there's only one God, knew there was not to be any gods before that one God, that they weren't supposed to have any graven images of any other gods or anything. It's crystal clear to them. All right? So all the people at the sound of the music bow and worship the golden image, except three. You know, this must have been a vast crowd you know, and, you know, couldn't you picture Shadrach saying, you know, why don't we just bend over and tie our shoes so we won't stick out so noticeably? And maybe no one will know we didn't go really go all the way down. They're not doing any kind of rationalization like that. That sounds like something I might have thought of when I was in eighth grade. You know, look, let's not be that noticeable. God knows we're serving him. All right, so... The accusers, you know, go forward to the king. And in spite of his fury against them, the king offers the three men a second chance. Why does he offer them a second chance? How many people do you think he would have given a second chance to that day? Listen to what Patriarchs and Prophets says. As the three Hebrews stood before the king, he was convinced that they possessed something the other wise men of his kingdom did not have. He already saw that in Daniel 1. He knew they had been part of Daniel's prayer meeting to get the, the dream in Daniel 2. And they're standing before him now. They're not shaking in their boots. They're not making excuses. They're just calmly waiting to see what he's going to do. And the Holy Spirit's working on him, and he realizes they got something. They're good people. I need these kind of people. See, so they had been faithful in the performance of every duty. He knew they were outstanding workers. He would give them another trial. He liked them. So even though the Bible already said it was in a rage and a fury, some rationality coming in there. All right, so the king is willing. Think about this. He's willing to repeat the whole procedure so these men can retract their position and worship the image. Don't you think some other people are saying, man, he must really, these are special people. I don't, know, I don't think he would have done that for me. All right, so, but should they refuse, they'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. All right, and then Nebuchadnezzar closes his appeal to them with what the author calls his most, a most arrogant claim, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? If you had been in their place, what would you have said? Well, King, you need to learn a thing or two. That'd be a little disrespectful, right? But you know what's funny? The author left this out. Um, you know, the verse says, we're not careful to answer thee in this manner. That sounds disrespectful, but I think what they're really saying is, we don't need any time to think. It's all clear to us. Amen. You know, because he, he's given them an extra chance. They're basically saying, we don't need an extra chance. It won't change anything. Because it's all clear to us. And I don't think they were disrespectful, even though it sounds like, you know, you could read it. Well, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. They said, no, we don't need to be careful. It, everything's all settled here. We don't need to rethink it. We don't need a second chance. And 
And then they go forward with, well, the author says, endowed with supernatural courage, they respond to the king. If this is the case, this, by the way, is a memory verse, but if this is a case wasn't included in the memory verse on the first page. If this is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Now, it's interesting that the first line says he's able, and then the second line is even stronger. He will deliver us. All right, that's the memory verse. Now, in um, Patriarchs and Prophets, she quotes that verse, and then she says, their faith strengthened as they declared that God would be glorified in delivering them. And with triumphant assurance, born of implicit trust, they added what comes next. Now, before we look at what they added next, I want you to think about this for a minute. They said, he's able to deliver us. He will deliver us. She said that as they expressed their faith in God, it got stronger on the spot. This is interesting, real interesting, because I believe that they sense that deliverance is imminent, but they have no objective proof. They have no certain evidence. And so then they continue with verse 18, says, but if not, see, they have to acknowledge he has not told us he's going to. He hasn't given us a vision. So if he doesn't, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So did they have absolute assurance they were, they were not going to perish in the fire? No, they didn't. Did they have a pretty strong hunch with the way God was handling the situation? Yeah, they did. Because they know God. They know he's the true and living God. And they know there's a lot of people here from all over the world. And it would be just like God to do this. All right. So down at the bottom of the page says, though they know their God can deliver them, they do not have the guarantee that he will. Nevertheless, they refuse to obey the king's command even knowing that they could be burned alive. Where do we get that kind of faith? Thursday's page gets more into the secret of faith. Let's go to Wednesday. All right, this is the fourth man. And so Daniel 3, we already read 17 and 18. We already talked about 16. So let's look at 19. When, when they answered Nebuchadnezzar like that, he says, don't even give us a second chance. He's like ripping mad. You're insulting my generosity. <laughs> and he's really angry. And then he you know, commands the furnace to be heated seven times hotter. I don't know how they can measure that. Um, and, but the, the, it tells us the fire slew the men who threw them in. And they, when they threw them in, they didn't just land on their feet says they fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So they're landing right on all the hot coals or whatever's there. And, and then verse 24, immediately, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake unto the counselors, did we not cast thee three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they said, oh yeah, true king. And he answered, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Now, before we go to the last couple of verses in that reading, I want to ask you the question, how did he know the fourth one was the form of the Son of God? All right, he said Daniel probably described the Son of God to him. I'm going to share with you Patriarch's Prophets. That's part of the answer, but there's more to it. It says, how, this is uh, Prophets and Kings 509. How did the heathen king know what the Son of God was like. This answer is going to blow your mind. The Hebrew captives filling positions of trust in Babylon had a life and character represented before, had in life and character represented before him the truth. When asked for a reason for their faith, they had given it without hesitation. Plainly and simply, they had presented the principles of righteousness, thus teaching those around them of the God whom they worshiped. They had told of Christ, the Redeemer to come. And in the form of the fourth in the midst of the fire, the king recognized the Son of God. So there are two sources. It was the life of the Hebrews and what they told them about the Son of God. Now, it's also possible that there was some connection with Daniel 2 and the stone coming down the mountain. 
But I thought, this is astounding. Their life and their testimonies about Jesus were such that the Holy Spirit was able to use that when he saw the Son of God, he knew who it was. Wow. I look at that and say, man, ah, if I could have a life like that and a testimony like that, doesn't that make you want something really big there? That heathen kings and heathen rulers and would recognize Jesus because of you, because of me. That's like, whoa. I just, my first thoughts are, man, I am not worthy. But yet that's what God calls us to, right? Oh, yeah, continuing. In verse 26, he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come out. And they come out. And verse 27 says, the fire had no power in them. The hairs of their heads weren't singed. Neither were their coats changed in any way. And even the smell of fire wasn't on them. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar then acknowledges God and says everyone should worship the God of the Hebrews. Who is this fourth person? We know who he is, right? Nebuchadnezzar knew. But he didn't know all these stories that had already happened, like the fourth one had appeared to Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The fourth one, the son of God, had wrestled with Jacob by the brook Jabbok. That fourth one had revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush. And on and on and on. He's Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate form coming to show that God stands with his people in their troubles. We have a, a nice short quotation here from Prophets and Kings 508 509 says, The Lord did not forget his own. As his witnesses were cast into the furnace, the Savior revealed himself to them in person. I love that. And together they walked in the midst of the fire. In the presence of the Lord of heat and cold, the flames lost their power to consume. And then we have that Bible verse that you mentioned, uh, Steve, Isaiah 43 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow, overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. So, you know, though we love stories like this, and when I was a kid, I just loved this story. I said, I'll believe in God. I'll be faithful. You know, that's the way I was thinking as a youngster. Uh, you couldn't help but be inspired to be brave like, like these guys. Um, but it does raise the questions because there are others who have not been miraculously delivered. Like Isaiah, the prophet Zechariah, who's slain on the temple steps, uh, John the Baptist, beheaded, James, Paul, and Peter, and Jesus himself. Oh, and Stephen, yeah. And then we have those who were delivered. Besides the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace, we have Dan the Lion's Den still to come up. We have Mordecai's story still to come up, who refused to bow to Haman, was supposed to, well, Haman wanted to execute him. and God delivered him in a miraculous turnabout. We have several times when they tried to take Jesus and he was miraculously delivered. But ultimately, he paid the price. So why does God deliver some but not others? How can we trust in God when he doesn't deliver? In what ways do people face this today? People can have great disappointment. A former student of mine lost her mother and a grandmother when a tornado hit where they lived 10 years ago. It's totally changed her faith and her beliefs because what she thought about God, she was disappointed and she hasn't recovered her faith yet. What ways do we face this today? Like, how about when people get sick or maybe they have cancer and they're praying their hearts out that God will do a miracle and it doesn't happen and, they, and it keeps getting worse and getting worse and then as it gets toward the end, they know they're going to die. That happened to my sister-in-law. She thought God was going to do a miracle. So she ignored most of what doctors said. She tried some natural treatments that she didn't do faithfully. She died. 
And my brother is trying to figure out what he could have done different. And he's not sure if she didn't give up her faith before the end. And that really troubles him. This is real, right? And so, well, let, let me ask you this. Um, does it take just as much or more faith when God doesn't deliver as when he does? Yeah. Yeah. But the author brings up a very positive thing at the end of uh, Wednesday's lesson. You look at it, it says, um, what is the miraculous deliverance that all of God's faithful people will have regardless of their fate here? So no matter what happens here, 1 Corinthians 15 is all about the resurrection in the future. So if you're allowed to be put to your rest here and you're a faithful person, you will be resurrected. You will have a, that, the, the victory then. All right, let's go to Thursdays. The secret of such a faith. So what is the secret of so strong a faith? How could they have been willing to be burned alive rather than worship the image? And it says, think of all the ways they could have rationalized submission to the order of the king. You know, I, I gave one. They could have pretended to tie their shoes, so to speak, uh, to not be noticed. But, you know, they could have just said something like this. Um, just to avoid a confrontation with the king, let's bow, just bow down to this image. But in our hearts, we'll remain faithful to God. Who cares if we bow down? We know our hearts are loyal to God. You, could you see how somebody might rationalize that? It says, despite realizing that they could have died as so many others have done, they nevertheless stood firm. All right? Because of time, I'm not going to read the quote on the back of Friday's, but Friday's quotation from Prophets and Kings is really good. Make sure you read it if you haven't already read it and marked it up. Um, then it says, you know, about Hebrews 11, what does this teach us about faith? You know, in Hebrews 11, um, I'd like you to go there. We're not going to read the whole chapter, of course, but there's a couple of verses that I think we'll need to look at. In Hebrews 11, you know, it starts with Abel by faith, you know, did the right sacrifice. Um, and it has Enoch by faith, was, you know, he was translated, Noah, Abraham, Moses, um, mentions Rahab. And then when you come to verse 35, it talks about women who saw their dead raised to life. Um, like the, uh, the woman of Shunem, who made the room for Elisha. And um, her child died and then was raised to life. But then it says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. You think of all the people in history who have given their lives, like during the, the Inquisition of the Dark Ages. In verse 36, as in others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings and imprisonment. Verse 37, and they were stoned, and you think of Stephen. Sawn asunder, you think of Isaiah. Slain with a sword. And so, uh, Basically, in the faith chapter, we see that God helped lots of people, delivered them from death sometimes, but there were other people of great faith who died, being stoned to death, being sawn asunder. Um, and sometimes people don't get what faith is. They, they, they treat it like it's just some good luck. Like they get, the author gives an example of someone who goes into a parking lot and prays for an open space so they don't have to walk too far. A car pulls out and says, yeah, God answered my prayers. Then the next time they come in, it doesn't happen. Say, well, God didn't answer my prayers at the time. You know, and so they're treating faith like some type of little good luck or a little thing where, you know, you manipulate God. That's nonsense. Faith is actually um, knowing God. It's actually knowing him. And so the, uh, the author says in this uh, third paragraph, last full one, says, Indeed, true faith, as manifested by Daniel's friends, is measured by the quality of our relationship with God and its resulting absolute confidence in God. Authentic faith does not seek to bend God's will to conform to our will. Rather, it surrenders our will to the will of God. And this is what these three Hebrews did. They didn't know how it was going to turn out, but they had faith anyway. They decided to do the right thing despite the potential consequences. That's what mature faith is. And so if faith is actually knowing God, the question is, how can we come to know God? Because any exercise we talk about faith is meaningless if it isn't connected to actually knowing God. So how can we come to know God? 
There's two basic answers. One, you've got to give God time with your life. And so we, and we know devotions, prayer, Bible study. But we also have to have experiences with God. So the question is, what experiences does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have before the fiery furnace that helped build their faith? The test with the food? Their lives on the line, praying for God to give the, the dream? They already had experiences that God had come through. And so the question is, what previous tests and experiences have you had that prepared you for bigger challenges that will come later? Have you had some experiences where you've been tested? I've had some. I have to admit, some of the lessons I learned the hard way, and God came through and helped me anyway. It wasn't because I was so smart and so faithful, but he was there in spite of it. And then I learned. You know, Jesus said, if you be faithful in that which is much, you must be faithful in that which is least. And so the Thursday's page ends with the little things. So to be prepared for big things, you need to have victory on the little things. And then my question is, such as, what little things do we need victory over? How about patience with people in our own family? How about being kinder? How about courage under peer pressure? How about victory in the kitchen? Victory with the internet. You know, these are areas we need to have faith. These are areas where we need to experience victories with God. These are the things that if we don't get victory over those, we're not going to be ready for anything big. We need to get victory over the little things. Prove faithful in the little things so that we can stand like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego when the big things come. Concentrate on the little things. Concentrate on Jesus. Victory over the little things. So again, if you're interested, this is the close of the lesson. If you're interested in receiving a D CD or DVD of this lesson, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sacscentral.org and ask for offer C22004. And thank you all for joining us today. And may God bless you and guide you and give you victory in the little things. <laughs>